Good morning, everyone. Good morning. That's the crowd I'm looking for today. My name is Peter Brown. I'm your MC today. Welcome to our international seminar, Voices of, Leader, Voices of Experiences, Leadership During a Disaster. I would ask us all just to take a moment to pause, though, this morning and to remember those who are dealing with one of the worst weather disasters in the southern part of our United States today. At last report, 173 Americans lost their lives to tornadoes. Certainly, this is a time when all of you would be very, very busy if this was in your backyard. So let us send our thoughts and prayers to all of our colleagues in the South today. We do have speakers from across the globe today with us who will share their personal experiences. We want to thank the Massachusetts Department of Public Health and 27 of our hospitals who are sponsoring today's event. We would also like to recognize the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Preparedness and Response for supporting this event. And our thanks to the Sheridan Norwood for hosting us and for pulling all of this together, those fine, talented folks back in their corner, Regina Villa Associates. Let's give them a round of applause. This promises to be a very informative and busy day, and we hope you leave with new perspective and lessons you can use and share with your teams. One of the ways we will accomplish this is for you to participate. So please listen carefully during all the presentations, and at the end, you will get a chance to ask questions. We have two microphones in the room, so if you do have a question after the presentation, we'd ask you to simply line up at the microphones to make it easy and to move quickly. Each of our presenters has played a key role in a large-scale disaster. They will talk about what happened, the response, and perhaps most important, the recovery. We also want to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to be here today and to make this commitment to learning more. Each and every one of you is key to our health care delivery system during a time of an emergency. So whatever information we can share with you today will certainly benefit our communities in the future. The, the support you receive is crucial, especially from our public officials. And I'd like to take a moment and recognize one of them who joins us today Attleboro Mayor Kevin Dumas, thank you very much for joining us today. Now it is time for our program to begin. And I have the privilege of introducing a dedicated and compassionate leader in our healthcare community. He is someone I've known for many years, from his days as the leader of the Boston Public Health Commission to his current role, which he accepted in 2007 as Commissioner of the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. He is a true supporter and a believer in the mission of public health. Under his leadership, the department has developed new and innovative programs to address racial and ethnic disparities, to promote wellness, to combat chronic disease, and of special note, his leadership in the successful passage of health care reform in our Commonwealth. The Commissioner has also taken a strong interest in emergency preparedness and providing resources to support preparedness at local health authorities, hospitals, health care agencies, and EMS. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce the Commissioner of the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, John Auerbach. Uh, 
Thank you very much, Peter. No, nobody is a better master of ceremonies and, and conference uh, facilitator than Peter, so it's a pleasure to be here. And, and it's really a pleasure to um, see how many people have come today. I think it's a reflection of the seriousness with which uh, you have addressed the issue of emergency preparedness and emergency planning. Uh, today's really a, a remarkable collection of individuals and, you know, uh, it's probably thousands of years of experience collectively that uh, in dealing with emergencies that are represented in this room. And, and that by itself, in terms of the breadth of the experience and the kind of people that are here, are worth uh, taking some note of. Uh, I want to also say thank you, Mayor, for coming. I think you're your coming here today is a, is a reflection of uh, the, recognizing the importance of this work and the great work that's been done in Attleboro. We also have um, uh, 27 different hospitals that are here today, and very importantly, we have leadership from the 27 different hospitals, and that's, that's critically important. I think there are 10 community health centers that are represented here, and there are scores of people from local public health, uh, local emergency planning, uh, hazmat, law enforcement, fire services, and having that type of uh, um, breadth of experience and diversity of experience, I think, speaks well to the productivity of today's activities. I, I want to start just for a minute by um, thanking the planning committee. Um, this kind of activity requires uh, people to put a lot of time and thought into the presentations, but also mobilizing folks to come out. So let, let me thank the members of the planning committee, and they are my uh, non-cousin, but very close friend, uh, Dr. Bruce Auerbach, Judy Bernice, Mike Flanagan, Ed Hennigan, Christian Lanfair, uh, Lynn Schof, and Tina Wright, as well as the folks from uh, Regina Biller. So uh, please join me in thanking the members of the planning committee. In addition to working um, as the head of the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, I now uh, hold a position uh, in an organization that represents all of the state health commissioners around the country, the acronym for which is ASTHO, the Association of State and Territorial, uh, the Association of State and Territorial Health Officers. And as such, I get to work with um, people from around the country, and when there are emergencies that are occurring in other parts of the country, I get to hear what the response is uh, and uh, how the mobilization has gone. You know, and, and, you know, and one thing I think that we've learned over the last several years is that we can, um, we can be sure that we will see each year at least one very significant emergency, and, and probably across the country, multiple ones. Uh, and that if we didn't have this level of emergency preparedness and emergency planning around the country, we would be in very difficult circumstances. So it makes, us, it makes you wonder, well, what were we doing before this level of sophistication, this level of activity, before, uh, largely before um, uh, September 11th? But, but now, you know, this kind of work is invaluable. Um, and so uh, Peter mentioned the, um, the tornadoes in Alabama and the fact that that's a major uh, public health emergency, and I've recently spoke to the, the commissioner from Alabama about their mobilization. But just in the last year, there, were, there was also, the, the, in the same part of the country, the emergency that was caused by the Gulf Coast oil spill. And, and that created uh, incredible challenges for the, uh, in terms of emergency response that, that people hadn't dealt with before. Uh, you know, new questions that, that hadn't been um, uh, addressed before about the safety of the food supply and how do you deal with that level of an environmental cleanup. Uh, very recently, we've dealt with the, um, the risks um, that the potential risks associated with the um, tsunami um, and um, uh, radiation crisis in Japan. And, you know, as, as you all may know, we were monitoring uh, and are continuing to monitor uh, the rainwater, uh, drinking water, and air uh, in Massachusetts for uh, the presence of uh, radiation. And this is happening around the country. We're seeing that level of mobilization and monitoring, and we're looking at it at a continual basis so that we can be sure that there isn't a risk to the public, and if there is a risk, that there's a, a, an ability to quickly mobilize. Um, you know, and 
So, so th these kind of anticipated emergencies, or uh, anticipate we're going to have them, we don't know the nature of them. We didn't know we'd have to deal with a radiation emergency. The folks in Alabama um, you certainly weren't, uh, weren't expecting the Gulf spill um, when they got it. Uh, perhaps tornadoes people have, are, are more familiar with uh, in certain parts of the country. So, so how do we ensure that we're prepared? Uh, ac clearly, activities like today's activities are very important. A at the Department of Public Health, we've uh, decided we had to do things differently in order to be ready to respond to emergencies. And over the last four years, we've reorganized the way that we're structured in terms of our response to emergencies. Uh, we used to have uh, hospital preparedness uh, in one place and um, uh, uh, other types of emergency response, uh, such as um, infection control related emergencies um, and uh, health, uh, public health readiness in another section. Well, we've now consolidated those into an emergency preparedness bureau. We've hired leadership like Mary Clark as our head and uh, Tim McDonald uh, to ensure that our work is coordinated and that we're aware of the various different activities within our own department and the linkages with different groups of you so that we're well coordinated and well prepared. Uh, and that's allowed us to, I think, make significant progress. Um, I think that today's efforts to look at four um, examples, very specific examples that have occurred over the last uh, several years and really understand what the lessons of those emergencies is, is an excellent way to go about planning. Uh, we don't take the time often enough after an emergency to really reflect on what we've learned and what we need to do differently. So doing that today, uh, talking about how things happened, where we were challenged, what we need to do differently, how we adapted already is great and I think it will be very helpful in terms of preparing for the future. We, we certainly have had our, our own experiences with emergencies in Massachusetts that are very real. And in addition to the, the non-emergency of radiation exposure, but one where we had to be sure there wasn't an emergency, we've recently had to deal with the aftermath of the Haitian earthquake. Why, why that took place on the shores of uh, another country, we had a lot of uh, Haitian Americans who lived in our state who were dealing with the trauma of the emergency. And we had to be actively involved in terms of that response. But we've also had uh, just in the last year, the uh, MWRA water crisis, where a third of the people in the state uh, lost their water uh, system for a while, and we had to be sure that that was safe and that there were ways of dealing with that and get complicated information out. We've had a lot of weather emergencies, from the ice storms to the spring floods. A and then we, we all went through H1N1 and really learned uh, a lot of lessons from that, including how to vaccinate um, virtually the entire population in a short amount of time. All of those examples, I think, are incredibly important ones as we go forward. So, so just in conclusion, I want to say th there's nothing, there's no better way to uh, be ready for uh, an emergency than to do the type of activities that are going on today. These type of activities combined with tabletop exercises and, uh, and uh, community-based exercises are critically important. We've learned that, that you have to go over the, the situations in detail, summarize them, talk them through, um, uh, point out where our weaknesses are if we're going to be fully ready, fully prepared and knowledgeable about the challenges that we face. One final thing, uh, we've got some challenges with regard to funding. And I would just say um, I, I'm concerned about as, uh, as uh, Congress is looking at um, making uh, this year, the $38 billion in cuts and, and, and probably much deeper cuts next year, we have to be sure that we don't lose uh, the capacity that we currently have around emergency preparedness. And there have been suggestions that we don't need the level of funding that currently exists with federal funding. So I would say, in addition to dealing with the emergencies that we're talking about today, I, I'd raise that the potential loss of federal funds for emergency preparedness is also an emergency we need to um, make sure we avert. And so I'd encourage all of us to be talking to our elected officials about how important the work is that we'll be talking about today and how critical it is that funding for such activities remain. So with that, 
Uh, again, ha I hope today is uh, very productive. Uh, I really appreciate the work that's going on here, and we know that you will be well prepared uh, for uh, the emergencies we're likely to face in the future. Thanks. Our first presenter is quite a story to tell. Let me set the stage. A packed nightclub. A fire breaks out inside. It happened late one night in Rhode Island in 2003. Jane Metzger was at home when the phone rang. She lived just five minutes away. At the time, she was a senior vice president and chief nursing officer at Rhode Island Hospital. In a night of horror and heroism, she and her staff attended to the victims of the fourth deadliest nightclub fire in American history. Jane has been recognized in local and national media following the nightclub fire for her leadership. In a tribute to nurses, the New York Times acknowledged her work with its Job Marketing Nursing Award, which is presented to only four nurses nationwide. Jane now serves as the Chief Nursing Officer at St. Vincent Hospital in Worcester. She is here today to recall the events of that night and the many days that followed. Jane? Is that clicker right there? Right there. Perfect. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for inviting me to speak today about managing the unthinkable, the station fire, and our lessons learned. I'd like to bring you back to that night, just before 11 o'clock on the night of February 20th, 2003, the 80s metal band Great White takes the stage at the station, a small club in West Warwick, Rhode Island. It's the kind of place where generations of young Americans have gone to dance to the beat of a local band or occasionally a national act and hang out with their friends and have a few pops. This Thursday night, the club is packed with at least 400 people, most from Rhode Island, most in their 30s, but all who have come to enjoy the music of Great White. You can feel the energy and excitement building in the crowd. A bear is raised as the pyrotechnics begin. Suddenly, something terribly goes wrong. Flames immediately start creeping up the nightclub wall. Fans initially think the flames are part of the act, but they're not. They quickly erupt into a fiery inferno. As the fire spreads and the polyurethane foam turns into flammable gas, some fans casually make their way toward the exit. Then panic breaks out. While some in the crowd are successful in leaving the building, others struggle to do so. As the air inside heats to 1,200 degrees, construction materials rain down on those still trapped inside. Oxygen rushes in to fuel the flames as windows and doors crash open. Within 30 minutes, the entire building is destroyed. In Rhode Island Hospital's ER, sorry, Andrea Bond is on her break watching television when all of a sudden she hears, we interrupt this program to bring you breaking news from West Warwick where the station, a local nightclub, is engulfed in flames. Dozens of victims are being treated and many more are thought to be trapped inside the building. Stay tuned for further details. Rhode Island Hospital is a 719-bed academic medical center and the only level one trauma center in Rhode Island. It is comprised of 32 buildings on a 64-acre campus. The Rhode Island Hospital Adult Emergency Department saw more than 80,000 patients in that year, 
and the adjacent pediatric ED handled 45,000 visits. This made the emergency services at Rhode Island Hospital one of the busiest in the United States at that time. On the night of February 20th, 2003, there were only 47 patients being treated in the ER, with another 14 patients awaiting at triage to go in. Behind the scenes, preparations were underway to receive the most badly injured patients from the fire. The events from the night of the fire descended on the emergency department at an incredible pace. We had participated in a number of disaster drills in the past, and I remember thinking, this is the real thing. Just take a breath and do the drill. As we prepared to receive the fire victims, I thought, okay, burn injuries. Anticipate intubations, pain management, burn dressings, just do the drill. As much as I would like to say I was prepared to do my job as a nurse, I was not prepared for the experience as a person. I witnessed true fear in the eyes of the burn victims. The silence, the smell, the suffering soaked into my skin and settled in my chest. There was a heaviness that was compounded with each patient the rescue workers delivered. There is no dread that prepares you for this. I was also witness to resilience. There was resilience in each of the victims, and there was resilience and resolve in each caretaker that came in contact with them. Emergency nurses who live by the words, be ready for anything, were. As I look back on that night, parts of it stay with me. Pictures of what I saw still assault my memory. The heaviness still lingers, but it has lessened over time. And my resolve has grown deeper roots. My name is Jen, Assistant Clinical Manager, Emergency Department. As I drove into the ED that night, I had to slow down due to the amount of media vans on Dudley Street. I immediately yelled, security, security, get those media vans off Dudley. I don't want EMS to have to slow down. I need access and egress, and I want it now. At 11.15 p.m., we heard, attention please, the disaster plan at Rhode Island Hospital is now in effect. This is not a drill. No one from the evening shift is to leave the hospital. Medical and surgical residents are to report to the ED. I repeat, this is not a drill. Several factors worked in favor of the patients on the night of February 20th. We had a 20 to 25 minute delay before the first patients actually arrived. Within that time, we had mobilized our disaster plan we had more than 30 physicians and 50 nurses and other staff available. At each stretcher, there was a physician, a nurse, and a respiratory therapist. It was also an unusually quiet night in the Rhode Island Hospital ED. Only about 40 patients were receiving care at the time the disaster was called. We were able to immediately transfer those patients to the Rhode Island Hospital Pediatric Emergency Department. In 2000, the state of Rhode Island and its acute care hospitals implemented HICS, the Hospital Incident Command System. The federal government was implementing this across the United States so that we would have a common vocabulary in response to disasters. Because the Rhode Island Hospital had multiple disaster drills, staff was very familiar with the roles and processes. HICS is a responsibility-oriented chain of command with duties divided into four sections. The largest and most complex area is operations, which was assigned to the chief nursing officer. Operations overseas not only support services in the care of families, but more importantly, the medical and nursing care of patients. Reporting to her was the chief of surgery, who was acting as the medical care director that night. Typically, these two roles would be functioning and overseeing operations from the command center. That night, we had an advantage because the fire occurred near the changes shift. This allowed us to hold in place both the evening and the night shifts, giving us the extra personnel required to meet the demands of the disaster. 
We were also very fortunate that Dr. Bill Chaffee, the Chief of Surgery, was in town. Dr. Chaffee has 11 years experience as an Army surgeon, serving as the Chief of the Burn Study Branch at the Institute of Surgical Research at Fort Sam Houston, Texas. He has treated burn victims from a major air show accident in Italy to a train collision in Russia and scores of other fires. The call came to Dr. Chaffee as he was just settling in to watch a Boston Celtics game. He was told that there would be 100 to 200 burn victims. That would be expected. However, his experience was, as a trauma surgeon, disasters are never as bad as anticipated. However, within minutes, as he was racing up I-95 with fleets of ambulances in his rearview mirror, he began to sense the scope of what lied ahead. Management was covered for that extra hour, and I was home, warm in bed. Little did I know that it would be the one hour that would have the most dramatic effect on my nursing career. At 11.30, the phone rang. It was Michelle telling me about a fire in West Warwick, a nightclub full of people. My response was typical. You're kidding. Stop joking around. Michelle repeated herself and then told me to get to work as fast as I could. When I realized she was serious, I sat upright in bed and immediately went into command mode. I lived 30 miles away, so I had plenty of time to listen to the radio while driving. Every radio station was broadcasting in somber voices about a catastrophic fire with hundreds of people trapped inside the building. The roads were slick, just before midnight, lots of black ice. My hands gripped the steering wheel as I headed to the hospital. As I turned onto I-95, I opened the window to get some fresh air. I didn't need the air to wake me up. My racing cars and rapid breathing took care of that, but I needed to feel the cold air on my face. It was at this moment that I experienced the brutal reality. What should have been refreshing winter air smelled of smoke. I looked left and saw billowing dark clouds against a brighter orange sky. I knew that it was all true. All I can see heading southbound is rescue after rescue. I cursed myself even more because I needed to be in the ED and was still eight miles away. A thought raced through my mind. What if there were no victims? With a fire so intense, it seemed possible that no one would make it out. That thought was quickly erased, though, when patient after patient arrived. Sooty, smoky, covered with snow, dirt, and dressing. I watched the nurses work as a team silently, efficiently, and with frequent glances at each other, each glance speaking volumes. As I moved from one area of the ED to another, I made sure everyone was okay. Do you need anything? I asked. Their response was morphine for the patients. I went to the Pixis, and my first thought was, there will never be enough morphine for all these patients. Standing by the Pixis was a young man from pharmacy. I didn't recognize him. I didn't know his name. Hey, you, Mr. Morphine, I said to him. Give me everything you've got. I'll pass it out to the trauma nurses first and then to the urgent area. Many of the ED staff had loved ones at the scene. The husband of one new grad was a firefighter. I could see her working diligently, but I knew her thoughts were with him. Some nurses had sons and daughters at the nightclub. They studied each patient, hoping they would not recognize any family member while waiting for that call from home to say, hi, mom, I'm home, I'm safe. I would remember that night forever. The glowing sky, the sirens, the quick glances, the morphine, the smell, the silence, the tears, and the staff working diligently to keep people alive. These I will never forget. I'm Kelly Carpet, clinical manager in the ED. Ambulance after ambulance from Rhode Island and Massachusetts roll into the emergency entrance at Rhode Island Hospital. By the dozens, they pull up to the emergency room. 63 victims suffering burns, in some cases to 40% of their bodies, are discharged into the care of the ED. First patient's arriving, heads up. Oh my God, she works here. At the time of the fire, there was a low census at all hospitals statewide. Rhode Island Hospital had units closed. 
This provided us the flexibility to move 33 patients of the surgical unit off the fifth floor in order to create a 43-bed burn ICU contiguous to the TICU and the surgical step-down unit. We continued to remain fortunate for the weeks that followed with a low trauma sensor, highly unusual for us, but clearly welcomed in meeting the demands of the disaster that had presented itself to us. Unique to the ED response was the establishment of bed control in the ED and on that fifth floor to coordinate flow. This allowed us to ensure treatment to bedtime of less than 20 minutes. That night, our culture was fully aligned around a clear sense of purpose. Everyone knew why we were here and what we had to do. All staff exhibited a bias for action and active listening. That night, there were no rules, barriers, turfdoms, or blame. The communication used that night, such as verbal readbacks, and the expectation that you would challenge care deliverers without regard to title and timeouts to assess the coordination of patient care is a technique known as med teams concept. Rhode Island Hospital was one of the first hospitals amongst 10 around the country to pilot the use of these specific communication techniques that promote teamwork. Lastly, the strong partnership exhibited by the chief of surgery and the chief nursing officer while directing the care in the ED was instrumental in the events that occurred that night. This became one of the key lessons learned and changes that we made to our Hicks plan following the disaster. We realized that it was imperative for the chief of surgery and the CNO to be in the ED jointly directing the response. Therefore, Rhode Island Hospital has modified its Hicks plan to ensure that in future disasters they will be at the site of treatment, orchestrating care, not in the remote located command center. During debriefings, we also realized that had that disaster not occurred at the change of shift and we had to call in staff, our staff would have used the same access routes that the ambulances were using. Knowing this, we modified our disaster plan to include new routes of access and parking plans for additional staff. This ensures that arriving staff don't impede the ambulance access to the ED. These routes are outlined in maps on the hospital's website. We made one other change to our Hicks plan. We identified a media lot with a satellite feed and a clear camera view to the ED entrance. Again, the goal was to minimize access problems for emergency response vehicles. That night, an ER physician who leads the Rhode Island DMAT team and chairs numerous committees statewide on emergency services stepped in to assume a role as the contact communicating with EMS workers at the site. He also established the status of available air crews to transport victims and the capacity of other level one trauma centers to accept potential victims. In our debriefing, we identified his actions as another critical success factor. As a result, we formalized this role in our Hicks plan and wrote position specifications for it. The silence is overwhelming and gives a profound gravity to the situation at hand. Personnel from throughout the hospital gather, lining the emergency department corridor known as Trauma Alley. With each arrival, a team descended on those patients, started lines, intubated, and moved them to the newly created burn ICU. No matter what was needed that night, the right person at the right time was in Trauma Alley. By 3 a.m. on February 21st, 63 patients had cleared the ED. The hospital's response didn't end with the ED staff at 3 o'clock. The fifth floor had turned into a 43-bed burn ICU. The nursing staff, two assigned to each patient, 
begins the process of helping survivors through the painful regimen of debridements, burn showers, skin grafts, and dressing changes. My first week in my new job as assistant clinical manager on the night shift. I have been performing marine charge duties for the past seven to eight years, but had never taken on a job of this magnitude. I remember looking at my watch, and for what seemed an eternity from that first call, only 20 minutes had elapsed. We were now getting updates from the scene and expecting our first victims to arrive. The adrenaline in that year could have powered several ships to the moon. Being new, my greatest fear wasn't about the care of the patients. My biggest fear was whether I, as a new manager, could direct my staff and others. I remember an eerie sense of calm descending as patients arrived. One of the first patients I had verbal contact with happened to be one of our CNAs who had gone to the concert that night. I remember her repeating, Am I going to be all right? I have never seen such fear, anxiety, and shock as I did looking into her eyes. I remember the overwhelming odor of smoke coupled with the severe, life-threatening injuries that just kept coming through our doors. Every so often, a small break would occur between patients arriving. Staff would hug, put a hand on the shoulder, and try to keep it together for the next victims. I remember, by 3 a.m., we had seen and treated over 60 patients. Although the department was now empty, anyone could see the battle for life that had just occurred. There are a few spoken words I remember from that night. The staff seemed to work in silence, but what I saw and what I smelled will remain with me forever. I learned many lessons. I was baptized by fire. I'm Michelle Hennedy, an assistant clinical manager in the ED. During the first week, the staff, many refusing to go home, cared for the survivors. At the start of the second week, FEMA relief personnel arrived. They acclimated to the unit as if they had been with us forever, supporting the patients and the families and us. Then on May 9th, he was the most seriously injured and now the last of more than 60 patients at Rhode Island Hospital to be released. Two and a half months after he arrived, John Van Dusen takes his first big breath of fresh air. They're an unreal staff. The girls and the nurses and, and, and the doctors are just big gods. With John's departure, a profound affirmation of health care at its finest arose from what seemed unthinkable on February 19th, the day before the disaster. On the night of February 20th, it took only 30 minutes for the station to burn to the ground. 97 people died in that fire. In the era of modern burn care, the station fire was the largest nightclub burn disaster in U.S. history and the ninth largest burn disaster of this type worldwide. To the media, this disaster was news. For days, Rhode Island Hospital was barraged by local and national print and broadcast media. Our communications department helped us identify crucial information to release to families, the community, and the country. Key executives were frequently interviewed, and to honor those who were providing care for the victims, we provided various staff members the opportunity to tell their stories. Some of the press wanted to interview staff. Some wanted to get on the unit to film and interview patients and families. By saying no to those who wanted access through us to patients and their families, we created a line of defense for them, protecting their privacy and avoiding any feelings of exploiting their tragedy. We realized in hindsight that the scope of the disaster blinded us to the need to constantly man the EMS line. Support on the line was crucial to those EMS workers who needed orders for meds. Basically, that night we picked up the phone and said, give whatever you need to give. But going forward, our HICS plan calls for a mid-level provider to man the EMS line throughout any disaster. We were also sensitive to family needs. Dr. Chaffee's decision to place all the victims on the same unit provided an unexpected benefit for families as they supported one another. At the suggestion of a physician, we conducted a series of family meetings in our George Auditorium where we outlined what was happening to the patients, the general course of treatment, and the long, long journey on the road to recovery. We designated a private dining room off our cafeteria as a refreshment center stocked with food and beverages for them. 
We also provided complimentary parking, free long distance phone service, and facilitated accommodations at the nearby Ronald McDonald House. What was perhaps our most profound learning was about how we took care of staff. We were so, so focused on the victims of the fire and their families that we temporarily lost sight of our staff's need for emotional support. Although we activated EAP and psych debriefings 48 hours after the event, they should have occurred the following morning. If we had known then what we learned about the depth of the staff's feelings when they developed a presentation for the Emergency Nursing Association, we would have created a year-long program of support. Three weeks after the fire, I wrote my experiences to help me and Laura. I'd like to read a portion of it to you. After the last victim came through the doors, the supervisor told us we could go home. I remember asking, are you sure there is no one else coming? Scott's not here yet. The, real the realization said that I had to call my friend and tell her we couldn't find her husband. At that time, I broke down. I stood in the hallway by the ACM's office and started crying. I went to the locker room and shook. Scott never did make it out that night. I went home, heartbroken, feeling like I just experienced my worst nightmare in real life. It was a bright, sunny day, and it all seemed surreal. The smell of burned flesh in my nose and the picture of horrible, burned and disfigured people forever etched in my eyes as I entered my home. The house was quiet. My children and husband sleeping peacefully completely unaware of the horror that just unfolded during the night. And me and my family were crying in disbelief that I had experienced what I did. I think I was in shock. I desperately wanted to talk to someone who understood. It was many days before we had debriefing at the hospital. My first night back to work, I pulled into the parking lot and could not get out of the car. I cried. Would the smell still be there? Was I good enough nurse to actually take care of these patients? I felt completely inadequate as a professional nurse. I felt I let down my peers and did not give enough care to the victims. I should have done more. I was not prepared. I let emotions interfere. I was a terrible nurse. The new grads were hoping that better than I was. I needed help. I was crumbling from the inside and I could not focus. Days later, the smell was still stuck in my nose and when I closed my eyes, I could still see the pictures of the faces that would flash like a slideshow in my mind. I was also trying to cope with the loss of a friend. I did take a night off, but it wasn't enough. I wanted to run away and never come back into the emergency room. I'm Andrea, and I'm an RN in the ER. A sense of closure didn't end for the staff when all the station fire patients left the ED. It didn't end the next day when all but one patient had been identified. It didn't end when all the patients were being cared for on the fifth floor. It continued months after the fire, when we visited the disaster site. We went to honor the victims. We went to honor our collective loss and our personal loss. Our healing deepened when a staff nurse placed a teddy bear beside the obituary of the dead wife of the patient she had been taking care of. It didn't even end at the year anniversary commemoration service that we held at 11.15 p.m. that night. And much to my amazement, it continued with each time that staff did the presentation of the reenactment of the station fire. D-1800, John Van Dusen. D-1900, Stephanie Simpson. D-2000, Ray Beauchene. D-2100, Philip Barr. D2200, Linda Fisher, and on and on. These patients are forever etched in my mind. I had the honor and privilege of being the Senior Vice President and Chief Nursing Officer at Rhode Island Hospital at that time. And the best disaster plan is one you use every day and the nation's level one trauma centers are the framework for this response. I thank you.